Hello Scatterventures and welcome to a brand new episode. I know it's been a while but we're back. In this episode we'll be having a closer look at the Intel Core i9-10900K. The 10900K is Intel's very first 10 core CPU on a mainstream desktop platform. The CPU was launched on April 30th and should be in stores right about the time that this video goes up. In this video we'll be covering the basic steps needed to get your CPU all the way up to 5.4 GHz. We'll dig into three different overclocking strategies. First, we'll simply unlock all the power limitations in the BIOS. Second, we'll use ASUS's AI overclocking technology to get a bit extra frequency. Third, and last, of course, we'll dig into manual overclocking. Before we dive into overclocking the 10th generation 10900K, let's have a quick look at the progression Intel has made with their 14 nanometer process technology. All the way back in 2015, Intel launched the Core i7-5775C Broadwell CPU as a successor to the Haswell. This was their very first 40 nanometer desktop CPU and came in the form of a quad-core processor with hyperthreading unlocked, clocked at a base frequency of 3.3 GHz and a maximum turbo frequency of 3.7 GHz. An overclocked and water-cooled CPU would be able to achieve a Cinebench R15 score of about 1000 points. In five years, the core count has gone up by a factor of 2.5 all the way to 10 cores, the base frequency has gone up by 400 megahertz, and the maximum turbo frequency by a shocking 1.6 gigahertz. A nicely overclocked 10900K Cinebench R15 score of around 3000 points. That's tripled the performance in five years, or an average growth in performance every year by 25%. That's pretty damn impressive engineering work. Along with the Intel Core i9-10900K processor, in this guide we will be using the Asus ROG Maximus 12 Extreme motherboard, a set of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4-4266 memory, and of course, EK water cooling. All this is mounted on top of our favorite open bench table. The Maximus 12 Extreme motherboard is the top board in Asus's Z490 lineup and sports a 16 power stage VRM as well as a very beefy VRM heatsink solution. This will come in handy as you later find out. The EK water cooling kit consists of the EK Quantum Magnitude CPU water block and the Coolstream PE360 radiator from an EK Kit X360. Last but not least, we also threw in an Asus ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti for good measure. The cost of the components should be around $3,500 US dollar. $500 for the CPU, $600 for the cooling, $750 for the motherboard, $200 for the bench table, $200 for the memory, and then about $1,300 for the VGA. The list of benchmarks that we'll use in this guide includes SuperPi 4M, Geekbench 5, HWBot X264, Cinebench R20, Realbench version 2.56, and the Final Fantasy 14 benchmark. Before we get started with pushing the performance of the Intel Core i9-10900K processor, let's first have a look at the benchmark scoring at stock settings. SuperPi 4M, 35.655 seconds. Geekbench 5 Single, 1440 points. Geekbench 5 Multi, 9685 points. HWBot X264 4K, 18.396 frames per second. Cinebench R20, 6,010 marks. Realbench version 2.56, 185,819 points. Final Fantasy 14, 89.85 frames per second. The first step will take us to unlock the power limitations in the BIOS. To get to the BIOS, hold Delete as you're booting up the system. From the main menu, navigate to Advanced tab and click on CPU Configuration. Then, scroll all the way down to Internal CPU Power Management and enter the submenu. In the submenu, change the CPU Core Cache Current Limit Max to 255 amps. Change the Long Duration Package Power Limit to 4095 Watt. Change the Package Power Time Window to 448 seconds. Change the Short Duration Package Power Limit to 4095 Watt. Disable the TVB voltage optimizations, and disable the TVB ratio clipping. Then press F10, save, and quit. In the operating system, you'll find that mostly the frequencies seem unchanged. 
However, when running the benchmarks and the workloads, the performance has slightly improved due to the longer and higher peak turbo frequencies. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. In SuperPi 4M, Geekbench 5 Single, and Realbench version 2.56, the score was pretty much identical. The largest increase was in Cinebench R20, with plus 5.5% in performance. Now, let's move on to the Asus AI overclocking. For many years, board vendors have tried to implement automatic overclocking features in their BIOS for simpler performance enhancement. This has always been a mixed bag, as most of the preset overclocking profiles are overly optimistic in frequency target or overly generous with the voltage selection. So often you end up with a slightly unstable or overheating system. Asus AI overclocking uses a different strategy. Instead of working with preset profiles, the system will monitor the CPU and cooling system throughout an initial phase of testing, then based on its findings, predict the optimal settings. The system will then automatically guide the overclocking process and adjust voltages and frequency to match your cooling system. The better your cooling, the higher your AI overclock. There are three steps to enabling AI overclocking. First, reset the BIOS to default settings. Then, reboot and enter the operating system. Run a heavy workload such as Prime95, Realbench, or Intel XDU for 10 to 30 minutes. Then, return to the BIOS and enter the AI OC guide menu from the top. Make sure to read through the explanation and when ready, simply click Enable AI. Then, press F10, save the settings, and reboot. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. Again, the performance in SuperPi 4M and Realbench version 2.56 are pretty much the same, and we saw the largest performance increase in Cinebench R20 with an increase of over 10%. Now, let's move on to the manual overclocking. Last but not least, let's get into manual overclocking. There are two main ways how you can manually configure your overclock. The first method is more traditional, as you sync all the cores to a specific frequency. The second method is by configuring the turbo per core usage. Before we get into the manual overclocking, please note that our system is cooled by a very high-end custom loop water cooling, and your results with AIO or lesser forms of cooling may vary. To determine the manual OC settings, I first rely on the information provided by the AI OC in the prediction sidebar in the BIOS. Here you will find the target frequency and voltages for your specific system. I use those as indicators and configure the manual overclock similarly. Of course, a lot of manual testing is required to ensure full system stability. The first method, syncing all cores, is the most simplest. Simply enter the BIOS, jump to the Extreme Tweaker menu, then enable XMP, set AVX instruction core ratio negative offset to two or lower, change the CPU core ratio setting to sync all cores, set the all core ratio limit to 53, disable ring down bin, set the minimum and maximum CPU cache ratio to 46 or lower, change the CPU core cache voltage to adaptive mode, then change the additional turbo mode CPU voltage to 1.45 volts. If you're running custom loop water cooling, make sure to also disable the wait for F1 if error message. This message will pop up in case no fan is attached to the primary CPU fan header on the motherboard. Then press F10, save settings and reboot. The second method is pretty much the same. The key difference is that you change the CPU core ratio to by core usage, then enter the by core usage submenu, set turbo ratio limit zero to 54, set turbo ratio cores 0 to 4, set turbo ratio limit 1 to 53, then set turbo ratio cores 1 to 10. This will configure a boost frequency of 5400 MHz for workloads up to 4 cores and a frequency of 5300 MHz for workloads up to all 10 cores. Of course, the AVX negative offset will enforce two bins lower, or 5.1 GHz, for an all-core AVX workload. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. Again, the SuperPi 4M score didn't really change that much. 
but we see larger gains across the benchmark set, peaking at plus 11.5% in Geekbench 5 Multi and also a 10% increase in Final Fantasy XIV. Looking at the percentage gains after overclocking, we kind of have to come to the conclusion that overclocking the Core i9-10900K isn't really all that beneficial. In single thread applications, we get the frequency up to 5.4 GHz, but Intel's thermal velocity boost frequency is already 5.3 GHz. In multi-threaded, uh, all-core non-AVX workloads, we get it all the way up to 5.3 GHz, which is 400 MHz higher than Intel would boost it, but that's probably more likely due to the excellent cooling solution than it is down to the headroom of the CPU. I was the most impressed, however, with the overclock achieved for all-core AVX2 workloads. We got a stable up to 5.1 GHz. That's stable as in 10 cores, Prime 95 AVX2, one hour and a half, 5.1 GHz. With CPU temperatures below 100 degrees centigrade, and VRM temperatures below 80 degrees centigrade. Times sure have changed. That's all for now, folks. I hope you picked up a trick or two from this video. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. And I guess if you want to see a video in another three years, hit the subscribe button.